Open your Bible, if you would, to the Gospel of John chapter 5. John chapter 5. So good to see everybody this Lord's Day morning. There are quite a few of our number who are gone because of illness, or at least are not able to be with us today because of illness. And um, I think uh, Mike is working on quite a hefty list uh, for the announcements. Uh, But we are here. And we're thankful for that, and we've been able to join our hearts, our minds, our voices together in praise unto God. And now to open up a portion of God's Word and consider its meaning and its application to our lives today. I don't know about you, but any time I hear someone say, we're going to be studying from the Gospel of John, my mind automatically has one thought, we're going to be swimming in the deep end of the pool. To me, that's where the Gospel of John is. You got Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then you got John way up here. And that's the way the Gospel of John is. We're going to take a look at chapter 5. I've been reading through John in my daily Bible reading this week, came across chapter 5. I've been wanting to preach from this text for a number of years now, and with the Bible reading this week and doing some thinking about what I'm going to preach, I decided today's the day, now's the time. Evidences is a very important aspect of the study of God's Word and God's existence. And we are involved in a study of evidences here at Knollwood every other Thursday night uh, via Zoom. We have a study in evidences, and we have that continuing this Thursday night at 8 o'clock and encourage you to take part in that. Jesus understood the importance of evidences. He understood the importance of giving uh, evidence... Uh, giving proof of who he was, proof of, of his identity as the Christ when it was necessary. But Jesus also understood the fact that there would be some who would not believe regardless of the proof and regardless of the evidence. And what we have in John chapter 5, we have Jesus healing a man at the pool of Siloam on the Sabbath day and telling him to rise up and to take his bed and to walk. And both of these were a violation of the Jewish tradition of keeping the Sabbath. Let's look in John chapter 5. Let's start at verses 8 through 11. John chapter 5 verses 8 through 11. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man who was made well took up his bed and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Well, word gets to this man that it was Jesus who had made him well, and so he reports back that it was Jesus who had done this to him. And we we skip down to verse 16. And we read, for this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Now in John's Gospel, this is the first that we read of this opposition that Jesus has uh, toward him from the religious leaders and and goes into some detail here in this chapter to talk about what all this is about and, and, and how it has come about. But here it is beginning. And notice they're wanting to kill him. Jesus understands this, so verse 17, But Jesus answered them, My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. So Jesus gives this defense. Yes, I do these things on the Sabbath day because my Father, He continues to do things on the Sabbath day. He stopped the work of creation on that seventh day of the creation week. But he continued to maintain that creation. He continued that work. And he says, that's all I'm doing in healing this man. I am maintaining my creation, doing my Father's work. Well, it was the way that Jesus referred to God that the Jews took offense at. Jesus said, my Father has been working until now. The Jews never would have referred to God in this way. Collectively, the Jews might have referred to God as our Father, but an individual Jew would have never referred to God as my Father. And when Jesus did, 
They understood Jesus to be saying, I have a unique relationship with God. I am his son, and he is my father, and we are united in that way. Well, that's just exactly what Jesus meant, and that's just exactly how they understood it, because verse 18 says, Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So there they are, they are looking to kill him, And Jesus is in a position where he can and he chooses to give a defense for himself. But before he gives a defense, he goes on to get into even more hot water. Uh, We're not going to take the time to read through these verses, but notice how Jesus... I want you to notice the reason these Jews were wanting to kill him. We've already pointed out in verse 16 and verse 18 that he's violating their view of the Sabbath. He's violating their traditions regarding the Sabbath, and he said that he is equal with God. He's made himself out to be God's son. But then if we would read on in verse 19, Jesus affirms that he is duplicating the works of the Father. The things that he's doing here on earth are the things that he saw the Father show him to do. In verse 21, Jesus claimed to have power to give life, Only God can do that. In verse 27, Jesus claims authority from God to execute judgment. And then in verses 28 and 29, Jesus affirms that on the last day, He is going to rise men from the dead. Now these are incredible claims for anyone to make. And if the person making them is not deity, they are blasphemous and they are deserving of death. And Jesus understands that. So, he then proceeds to show that he is able to say these things because he is deity. He needs to produce some evidence. And he does so by calling forth some witnesses. If you're on trial and you're wanting to affirm your innocence, well, your lawyer will call forth some witnesses who will testify on your behalf. So Jesus here in this text, verses 31 through 47, Jesus is going to call five witnesses. He's going to call five witnesses to testify on his account that he is the Son of God, that he is deity, that he does have the right to make the claims that he makes before these Jews. Again, some will accept it, some will not, but they're going to do it in spite of the evidence. He's going to offer the evidence. What evidence? We're talking about evidences. What evidence would Jesus offer to show that he is the Son of God? Interestingly, the first witness is himself. Look at verse 31. Verse 31 reads very strangely to our ears to hear Jesus saying this. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. When was Jesus ever not true? When was Jesus ever not reliable? When did Jesus ever say anything and then say, you know, you can't take my word for that? So this this sounds very strange to us. We need to understand what Jesus is doing is, is He's acknowledging the demands that God's law have set forth regarding the validity of testimony. In the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 19 and verse 15, Moses wrote, One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. So Jesus can begin with himself, but he says, I know that my testimony isn't going to be enough in this situation. You're going to need other eyewitnesses. You're going to need other evidence, and it's got to come from someone other than myself. So Jesus wasn't saying, hey, you can't trust me. I'm a trickster. He was saying, I know that we need multiple witnesses here. But nonetheless, he starts with himself. And I would make this observation before we go on. If you and I are believers, we already have seen the evidence. We've already decided that Jesus is who He claims to be. And so, 
We can take His word for it. Whatever Jesus has to say about life in this world or, or life that is to come, we can accept it and we can believe it because Jesus has already established the validity of His claim to be the Son of God to our satisfaction. So I want us to understand that. Moving forward, you and I as believers, we can take the things that Jesus says. But in this setting, he, he realizes you need more than just one witness. And I can't be testifying on my behalf anyways. We need other witnesses. Well, well who would these other witnesses be? Well, he proceeds immediately to talk about John the Baptist. Here's his next witness that he would call to give, to give testimony. Let's read verses 32 through 35. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that witness, which, that witness which he witnesses of me is true. Now in verse 32, he's speaking of the Father, and he'll get to him again in a few verses. But then, verse 33, you have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in His light. There was testimony given by John the Baptist, and this testimony had been verified by a delegation of priests and Levites that had been sent to John. If you go back to John uh, chapter 1, John chapter 1, verses 19 through 28, here John the Baptist is introduced, and we read in verse 19. John 1, 19. Now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? They want to know of John, Who are you? Well, John confessed he was not the Messiah, he was not the Christ, but he spoke of the one who would come after him. In verses 26 and 27, John answered him saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. So John says, there's one coming after me who is greater than I am. That's the testimony that was given by John. And if we stay here in John chapter 1, John the Baptist would go on to proclaim that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and He is the Son of God. So if we could have John the Baptist come up and take the, the witness chair, and we could have ask his testimony, what would he say of Jesus? He would say that He is greater than I am, He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin that, of the world, and He is the Son of God. Now most of these Jews who are hearing Jesus speak in John chapter 5, they, they understand who John is. They accept him as a prophet. Just like we talked about in the previous hour out here in our study of Luke chapter 7. Who did you go out to the wilderness to see? You went out to see a prophet. And most of them would have said, yes, we went out to see a prophet. Well, if you believe he is a prophet, then you've got to believe what he says about me. He is one of my witnesses. So Jesus is greater than John. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Son of God. But here's what's interesting. We come back to John chapter 5. Jesus says, I've got an even greater witness than John. John is a great prophet. He is he's the greatest of the prophets. But yet I've got a better piece of evidence than that. In John chapter 5 and verse 36, but I have a greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish. The very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. As great as John was, there was a greater witness. The works that I do. And that, that word is used a lot in the Gospel of John to refer to our Lord's miracles. They're called wonders and signs in other passages, but, but in John, often, it's simply the works. The works that Jesus did, the miracles that He performed, they served a primary purpose. Peter, in Acts chapter 2, and verse 22, as he is preaching the first gospel sermon, in Acts chapter 2, and at verse 22, Peter says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth 
a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Those miracles that Jesus performed were performed by the power of God and with the approval of God for one purpose, to validate his claim that he was the Son of God. And so Jesus says, I've, I've, got, a greater, uh, ev- I've got a greater witness than John, the works that I do. These works bear witness of me. The Gospel of John covers seven miracles that Jesus performed. It's interesting the way John has laid out those seven signs or those seven works that Jesus did. Matthew, Mark, and Luke cover a whole bunch. But we know that that all four accounts combined didn't cover them all. In John chapter 20, John chapter 20, well, uh, let's look at John chapter 21, verse 25. The very last verse in the Gospel of John says, And there there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. So we're not given everything that Jesus did. The Holy Spirit had John select seven. And look at John chapter 20 verses 30 and 31, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. That's why the signs were performed. And you know what? The Jews were looking for that. The Jews were looking for these signs that would validate that would accreditate Jesus. If you go back to John chapter 6, in John chapter 6 and at verse 30, John 6 and at verse 30, we read, Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Here you are preaching, here you are claiming to be who you are. Where's the sign? Where's the miracle? Here's what's interesting as you read the Gospel of John. Honest Jews accepted this testimony. Honest Jews saw the signs for what they were. Nicodemus in John chapter 3. John chapter 3 verse 2, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now Nicodemus isn't ready to... to, to take it all the way out to Jesus being the Son of God. He hasn't connected the dots all the way out there yet, as early as John chapter 3, but he's on the right track. You're doing these works. You're doing these miracles. That means that you are from God. In John chapter 7 and at verse 31, when controversy is is breaking out again among the Jews, verse 31, and many of the people believed in Him and said, When the Christ comes, will He do more signs than these which this man has done? See, they're connecting the dots. They they see the evidence. And this is where it points to this man, at least we know that he is from God. So here in John chapter 5, I've got a greater witness than John, the works that I do. They testify as to who I am. Honest Jews believed it. His enemies did not. His enemies did not. His enemies didn't doubt that He performed miracles. But on at least two occasions, His enemies said He cast out demons by the power of the devil. Yeah, He's doing miracles, but He's doing it by the power of the devil. And in John chapter 11, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, they couldn't deny that that had happened, so their response is, let's kill Lazarus again. Let's put him back in the grave So there is no evidence of this miracle, and Jesus will just go away. All this will go away. So again, Jesus knows that there are some people who aren't going to believe despite the evidence. But for those who have a heart and a mind to believe, He makes sure we have all the evidence that we need. So the works that Jesus performed, they are a piece of evidence. But fourth, 
A fourth witness that Jesus offers here in John chapter 5 is His Father. Now He's been talking about Him all through this text, but here verses 37 and 38, He's mentioned specifically. And the Father Himself who sent Me has testified of Me. You've neither heard His voice at any time nor seen His form, but you do not have His word abiding in you, because whom He sent, Him you do not believe. The Father is also bearing witness to Jesus. How is it that the Father is bearing witness to Jesus? Well, we know that on three occasions, the voice of the Father was heard on earth. It was heard at our Lord's baptism. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. It was heard at His transfiguration. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye Him. And John chapter 12 tells us that His voice was heard at the triumphal entry. Although no, no one could understand what was being said, the voice was heard. And so could this be what Jesus is talking about? That, that my Father has testified of me? It could be. Chronologically speaking, here in John chapter 5, I believe only the baptism has occurred to this point. Uh, so, so if he is talking about that verbal testimony, it, so far it's just been at his baptism. But I believe if we go back to what we saw in Acts 2 verse 22, every miracle Jesus performed, the Father was testifying, this is my Son. God, or Jesus performed those miracles and it was God working through Him, accrediting Him, certifying Him, this is my Son. But notice, Jesus says, you've never heard and you've never seen Him. And so the Jews weren't in a, in a position to respond favorably to the testimony that was given by the Father. They'd never heard the Father they weren't in heaven before hearing the Father as Jesus was. They'd never seen the form of the Father. Although when they saw Jesus, they saw the Father. But they didn't understand that. Here, really, this is the crux of it. They didn't allow His Word to abide in them. And that really was where the problem was. This was the primary obstacle. When they rejected Jesus... They were rejecting the Father and His Word. And Jesus is going to explain that really in the next point. But God had told them. God had bore witness to Jesus, not just verbally, but God had also bore witness to Jesus in the miracles that He was doing. That brings us to this last piece of evidence, and it is the one that Jesus spends the most time talking about, and that is the Scripture. Here's this fifth testimony, this fifth witness that we can bring up, and that is the Scriptures. This is the most powerful body of evidence that Jesus has to, to set forth, and that is the Scriptures. The Jews accepted the authority of the Scriptures. The Jews had a great love and a great respect for the Scriptures. Verse 39, Jesus says, You search the Scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. Jesus isn't giving the order for them to go and search the Scriptures. That's the way the rendering is in the King James Version. Search the Scriptures. I don't believe it's an imperative. I believe what Jesus is doing is making an observation and, and really could be offering a compliment. You search the Scriptures. And that word for search means to investigate. It means to look carefully. In, in the, the translation that I'm using in my daily Bible reading, as I was reading through this text, the way it rendered this verse is, you pour over the Scriptures. And that stood out to me. We know what it means to pour over something. You know, if, you're, if you're studying a subject for an exam, uh, if you're investigating something, you leave no stone unturned. You immerse yourself in that. And Jesus says, that's what you do with the Scriptures. See, the Jews, they knew their Scriptures. They knew their Scriptures, and they had the proper motivation for doing so, Jesus says. You search the Scriptures, 
For in them you think you have eternal life. And that's right, life is found in the Scriptures. And so there's their motivation for searching the Scriptures. However, the Jews failed to find this life because they regarded their biblical studies as an end in and of themselves. They searched the Scriptures, yes, but they failed to see what the Scriptures were pointing out to them. They failed to get to where the Scriptures would have led them. Jesus says, for it is these, these are they which testify of me. As as we're reading and studying the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures, we ought to see that they are pointing us to Jesus. That's what the Old Testament Scriptures do. Back up a few pages to John chapter uh, Luke chapter 24. In Luke chapter 24, this is right after our Lord's resurrection, and He meets the two men who are walking on the road to Emmaus. Luke chapter 24, and at verse 27, it says, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, He expounded to them in all the Scriptures the things concerning Himself. I wish that sermon had been recorded. I would have loved to to be able to hear from Jesus Himself to go back to the writings of Moses and all the prophets and pull out from all of them all the Scriptures that speak of Jesus. But they're there. They're there. Now you, you go just a few verses down as Jesus is commissioning His apostles. He's about to send them out Uh, to to all the world before His ascension into heaven. This is Luke's account in Luke chapter uh, 24, verses 44 and 45. Then He said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning Me. And He opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. As we're reading the portions of the Old Testament that that are the law of Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament, they're speaking of Christ. They're pointing towards Christ. As we read the prophets, they're speaking of Christ. As we read the Psalms, they're speaking of Christ. I like what's being done in some of the classes down the hallway. Uh, Last quarter, it was a study of Genesis. This quarter, it's a study of Exodus. And, and the challenge in some of the classes down the hallway is to find Jesus in the book of Genesis. And find Jesus in the book of Exodus. He's there. He's there. In the book of Galatians, at chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, as Paul is writing to these Gentile Christians who are being told that they need to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses in order to be saved, he says, no, that's that's not true. The law of Moses has served its purpose. What was the purpose of the law of Moses? Chapter 3, verse 24, therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. That's what the law was for. That's what the Old Testament is for, to tell us that Christ is coming. The Gospels tell us Christ is here. The rest of the New Testament tells us Christ is coming back. Notice the Jews knew the words of Scripture. But they did not know the Word of Scripture. Capital W Word from John 1 and at verse 1. The Jews knew the words of Scripture. If you told any Jew in the first century, the Lord thy God is one They could repeat the rest of that passage from the book of Deuteronomy. They knew it by heart. If if you would quote the first line of any psalm, they could recite the rest of it to you. That's exactly what Jesus is doing when He's hanging on the cross and He says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting the first line of Psalm 22 to, to recall to their memory that entire psalm that is being fulfilled right before their eyes. That the Son of God is being killed, nailed up, pierced His hands and His feet right before them. They knew the words of Scripture. But they didn't see that it pointed to the capital W word of Scripture. They were prejudiced. They were arrogant. 
They were stubborn. They were untaught. Whatever the reason was, they didn't see it. But you know what? It can happen to me and you as well. We can read and we can study and we can show up for Bible class and we can meditate and we can discuss the Scriptures. But it's a vain exercise if we fail to see that it leads us to eternal life in Jesus Christ. The purpose of Bible reading and Bible study for us brethren is not so that we can be Bible trivia champions. It's so that we can transform our minds into the image of Christ. And so that we can become wise for eternal salvation. That's what the Scriptures are for. They knew their Scriptures. You search the Scriptures. Do we search the Scriptures as well as they did? And they didn't even come to an understanding. How are you and I doing? But Jesus goes on in verses 45 through 47 to say that they search the Scriptures, but they don't believe the Scriptures. You don't believe the Scriptures. Read verses 45 through 47 with me. John chapter 5, 45 through 47. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? These, these Jews he's talking to, they trusted in Moses, verse 45. They trusted in Moses. They considered themselves to be disciples of Moses. That's what they tell Jesus uh, in, in another passage, that they were disciples of Moses. Chapter 9, verse 28 of John. They're disciples of Moses. But they failed to see that Moses was talking to them about Christ. When, when Jesus says that, that Moses would accuse them, he has reference to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 18 and 19, God told Moses that he was going to rise up another prophet and that the Jews had better listen to him. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 18 and 19, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. These Jews, they knew the Scriptures. They knew this passage right here. The very one that God spoke to Moses about was standing right in their presence. And they would not believe what He said. And so, they had Moses judging them. Because they rejected the prophet who would come. Then Moses was accusing them and condemning them from their own scriptures. You know what? The same thing can happen to us. In John chapter 12 and at verse 48, Jesus says that the words that He has spoken will judge us on the last day. But if we refuse to believe and refuse to obey those words, we're going to be in the same place as these Jews who rejected Christ. We're going to have our own scriptures accusing and condemning us on that last day. So brethren, do we search the Scriptures? How well are we doing with that? Are we pouring over the Scriptures? Are we striving to understand them? Are we doing our best to obey them? It's a great challenge that's set before us from this text. We've just barely scratched the surface here in John chapter 5. There's so much here but I wanted us to take a look at the evidence that Jesus sets forth. Evidence was important to Jesus. And, and he realizes it's important on this occasion to present some evidence, to give a defense. Isn't that interesting that on the night that he is brought before uh, the high priest, and then that morning that he's brought before Pilate, he's silent, he doesn't say anything in his defense. John chapter 5, he's got lots to say in his defense. We better listen to it. 
we'd better hear it. There are witnesses. There is evidence. The evidence for Jesus being the Son of God exists in abundance. There's no question about that. The question lies in, will you be honest with this evidence? Will you and I accept this evidence? Will we act upon it? Will we obey it and receive eternal life in Christ Jesus? If you're here and you're not yet a Christian, not yet a child of God, you need to become one. Not because we've said so, or your parents or grandparents have said so, but because you can see the evidence for yourself. You've got the Word of God, you can read it, and you can see it for yourself. And when you are convinced from the evidence that Jesus is the Son of God, then that's when it's time for you to act. That's when it's time for you to respond in obedience. By repenting of your sins, confessing your faith, and having those sins washed away, in the watery grave of baptism. If you've done that, but you've become unfaithful to the Lord, I hope this sermon has reminded you of exactly who He is, and your need to repent and get right with Him. Whatever your spiritual need is, would you let it be made known by coming forward as we stand and sing this invitation song?